Last time we discussed what arguments are for, their purposes. We saw that arguments have at least three purposes, namely persuasion, justification, and explanation. We also saw that one way to explain something is to cite its purpose. So we can understand why Joe went to the store uh, by seeing that he went to the store because uh, he wanted some milk, so his purpose was to get milk. Similarly, we can understand arguments by looking at their purposes, and that's what we did last time. But this time, we're looking at a different kind of explanation. And As we saw, one way to explain things is to look at the material. So you want to understand why a MacBook Air is so light. The answer is, it's made out of aluminum. Similarly, if we want to understand arguments, we're going to gain understanding by looking carefully at the material that they're made out of. And we saw that arguments are sets of sentences, statements, and propositions. So that means they're made out of language. So in this lecture and the next few, we're going to look at the nature of language in order to better understand arguments. So if we know that arguments are made out of language, we know that the only creatures who can give arguments are ones that can use language. Now some people think that other animals can use language, and there's a minimum kind of language that other animals can use. But other animals cannot use language that's complex enough to make arguments. It might seem that there's some exceptions. Here's one possibility. But no matter what it sounds like, this goat is not really arguing. Maybe he's fighting, maybe he's fending off what he takes to be an enemy, but he's not arguing. So, if other animals can use language, we can't define humans as the animal that talks, but we can define humans as the animal that argues, or, as Aristotle said, the rational animal, the animal that reasons, because other animals don't do that. Humans are the only one that argues and reasons in this sense. So, we can understand humans and arguments better if we understand language better. Now, I can't tell you everything that needs to be said about language. You'd need to take a linguistics course for that, and I recommend that you try one, because it's very interesting. But here, I'm only going to be able to make four basic points about language. First of all, language is important. Second, it's conventional. Third, it's representational. And fourth, it's social. That should at least get us going in understanding what arguments are made of. First, language is important. It would be extremely difficult to live life without language. Just try to imagine what it would be like. It's really hard to imagine. But think about someone like Helen Keller, who was born uh, able to see and hear, but very shortly thereafter lost her ability to see and hear. And it was only much later in life that she gained the ability uh, to use language because she never had that in her early years. And when she gained that ability, she was amazed. W-A-T-E-R, water. It has a name. W-A-T. When Helen Keller gained the ability to use language and to communicate, uh, she didn't become able to see or hear. She still couldn't see or hear, but she could do amazing things. She went around the country giving presentations. She graduated from Radcliffe College. All of that was made available to her simply by adding language and communication to her life. So language is extremely useful, and that explains why it's all around us. I mean, just imagine walking down the streets of a city and all the signs that you'd see. You just see words here, there, and everywhere. And now we have a mystery. If we're not paying attention to language, then how can we use it so well to achieve so many purposes? And the answer to that lies in the second general feature of language that I want to talk about. Namely, language is conventional. But what's a convention? Remember that in the United States, people drive on the right-hand side of the road. That's our convention. But what does that mean? It means that there's a general pattern of behavior that most people throughout society obey on a regular basis and they criticize people who deviate from that pattern. And the same applies to language. 
We have certain patterns of using words in certain ways, and when people deviate from those patterns, we criticize them. We say they're misspeaking or it's ungrammatical. Of course, conventions can vary. I mean, everybody knows that there are many countries around the world where people don't drive on the right-hand side of the road, they drive on the left-hand side of the road. The United Kingdom's one of them, but there are lots more. And the same applies to language. You can have the same word that's used to mean very different things in different languages. The most notorious example is football. In the United States, it's used to refer to American football, whereas in the rest of the world, it's used to refer to what Americans call soccer. And people in the rest of the world think that America is kind of silly because you don't use your feet uh, on the ball except for punting and place kicking in football. But whether it makes sense or not, the point here is simply that the uh, conventions can vary from one part of the world to the other. And of course, you can do that with any word. You could, in English, use the word money to refer to socks. Uh, at least the English language could have done that. Uh, it didn't but it could have. So in this way, conventions seem to be kind of arbitrary. They could have been very different. But language is far from completely arbitrary because the conventions of language have limits. And two of these limits that I want to emphasize come from the fact that language is also representational and social. So first, language is representational. When we use language, we're often trying to refer to objects in the world and describe facts in the world. And you can't change those objects or those facts merely by changing your language. One good story to illustrate this uh, is about the young Lincoln. When he was a lawyer, he supposedly uh, examined a witness uh, during a trial and he said, okay, how many legs does a horse have? And the witness said four. And then Lincoln said, well, if we call a tail a leg, then how many legs does a horse have? And the witness said, well, then I suppose the horse would have five legs. And Lincoln said, absolutely not. That's wrong. Calling a tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. And the point of this story, whether it's true historically or not, is that language cannot change the facts of the world. It can't make horses have five legs if you merely change your language. Here's another example. Suppose that you don't have much money, but you happen to have a lot of socks in your drawer. Well, you could say, I'm going to use the word money to refer to socks. And now, all of a sudden, I've got lots of money. I'm not poor anymore. It ain't going to work. And that's because language, again, can't change your financial situation. Uh, because that's a fact about the world, not about how you're using the word socks or the word money. And the other limit on the conventions of language comes from the fact that language is social. Sure, sometimes we talk to ourselves uh, and use language to write things down, write notes to ourselves, for example, uh, without other people around. But basically, language evolved uh, because of its social function. And what that means is that there's a point in following the conventions of the language uh, as shared by the rest of the society that speaks that language. You know, I've always thought that it was kind of silly that grapefruits are called grapefruits. Sure, they're fruits, but they don't look like grapes at all. They look more like lemons. They're like really big lemons. And that's why I think they ought to be called mega lemons. But if I went to a restaurant and I wanted to order grapefruit juice so I turned to the uh, the service person and said I'd like some mega lemon juice I probably wouldn't get what I wanted and so even if I think the language is not using the right conventions there's a point in following the conventions of the language in order to be able to communicate with other people and get what I want and again the great philosophers Monty Python saw this very well when they produced their little clip called The Man Who Speaks Only in Anagrams. Our first guest in the studio tonight is a man who talks entirely in anagrams. Tatsy Creoct. <laughs> do you enjoy this? Uh, I stom certainly odd. Uh, Revy Chum so. And what's your name? Hamrag. Hamrag Yattelrot. So the point is obvious, namely, language is shared, and once it's shared, then it makes sense to actually follow the conventions of society, uh, even if you don't uh, like them.
Overall then, language is important and it's conventional in ways that might seem arbitrary, uh, but actually is limited in important ways by the fact that language is also representational and social. But it's kind of cheap to say language is conventional. Which are the conventions? Which are the rules uh, that language follows? And this is actually extremely complex because language follows rules or conventions at many different levels. Just take a real simple example. You walk into a pizza shop and you say, give me pepperoni. Well, the person then fixes a pepperoni pizza uh, and you pay for it. But how did that work that you said, give me pepperoni? Well, first of all, notice that you had to use words that were meaningful to the person you were speaking to. Gimme wasn't a word in English uh, a long time ago, but this person understands gimme as a word and therefore they can understand it. But in addition to those semantic constraints, you also have to have physical production constraints. You have to say it loud enough. If the pizza shop is really noisy, then you have to speak pretty loudly to get the person behind the counter uh, to understand what you're saying. You also have to put the words in the right order. If instead of saying, give me a pepperoni pizza, you said, pizza a give me pepperoni, they might not understand at all what you're saying. So there's structural combination rules that you have to follow as well. And there are also etiquette rules. In some pizza places, if you just said, give me pepperoni, the waiter might say, well, forget it, sir, I don't serve such impolite, impolite people. I certainly would say that to my son. If my son said, give me pepperoni, I wouldn't get him a pizza. I'd say, you need to ask me properly. Uh, so rules of etiquette can also get in the way of communication uh, and cooperation. So language operates at all of these levels. Physical production, semantics or the meanings of words, syntax or the rules of grammar, and etiquette. Now all of this might seem obvious to you, and it probably should be obvious to you. But the rules of language are not always obvious, and that's what we're going to be learning throughout this course. I'll start with a simple example. Uh, what's this? Well, that is a finger, okay? But what's this? Oh, that is a singer. This is not a finger, and oh, that's not a singer. Why do we pronounce the word finger with a hard G and the word singer with a soft G? That's a rule that we all follow, but very few people know the rule behind that pronunciation. So, do you know the rule? Take a little while and think about it. Have you got it yet? Okay, I'll tell you the answer. When a word ends in N-G-E-R and it's derived from a verb that ends in N-G, then you get a soft G, like singer. But when the word that ends in N-G-E-R is not derived from a verb that ends in N-G, then you get either a hard G, like finger, or a kind of medium G, like plunger or danger. Now, when do you get that medium G or that hard G? That's a trickier question. I don't know the answer to that one, which shows that we can all use language according to rules without knowing what the rules are. We don't have to be conscious of the rules at all. And a lot of what we're going to be doing in this course is looking behind our language to try to figure out the rules that govern the way we use language, especially when we're making arguments, in order to better understand what we're doing. Some of the answers we give will be obvious once you mention them, but I bet you hadn't thought of them before.